Hello there, Internet. It's been a few weeks since I've been able to do any videos. As I said in my last video, we're waiting for the little one to arrive, and she did on March 8th. And since then, it's been a nonstop routine of changing diapers, burping, bathing, feeding, all of those things. Mom and baby are doing well. In fact, she finally slept through the night last night for the first time. Hooray! But with that out of the way, let's talk about Elite Dangerous 3.0 Beyond, essentially about a month and a half later. Now, I've not got to spend a lot of time in Elite Dangerous 3.0. I did in the first week that it was released, and then I've only had a few hours here or there in order to participate. Now, I have talked to people who've been able to spend more time in the game than I have, and some of their thoughts and opinions on some of the new various changes to the core mechanics of the game. So, I thought that I would kind of lay them out here. First up, the very good things is the fact that the debagification of the galaxies has happened. There's a color palette that has returned. And apparently now that if you kind of know what you're looking for, the surfaces of planets will vary dependent upon the work, their composition and makeup, including of materials. If you know what materials you're looking for, you can essentially land in areas where you'll find certain materials at higher concentration than others. I haven't gotten that far into playing it to know exactly how all of this works and if you say need tellarium, where do you need to go in order to find that on a planet that says it contains a couple percentages of it. That being said, it is making it a delight to go to engineering bases, surface bases and things like that just to see planets that just aren't the same shade of brown almost universally. So I am very glad to see this, and in VR, it is absolutely amazing. I never really got to experience the galaxy before the beigeification of it in VR, and now being able to see this, it's like playing an entirely new game. And if it is one thing that does bring me back to Elite Dangerous, is there's, especially in VR, this element of majestic beauty to the game that just simply doesn't exist in anything else out there, at least not right now. Along with that, the changes to the engineering systems I am absolutely loving, including the introduction of material traders. I know in some cases that the ratios aren't that good when you need to trade up. Trading down is a little bit better. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad to see that it's there. It's making going through the engineering process overall a lot faster. And the fact that we all now end at that same level. And no more is it that somebody on the third roll gets a god roll and the next person rolls a thousand rolls and doesn't get anywhere close to what that one person who just got lucky with RNGs is that day. So I'm glad to see that basically if you spend enough rolls, the only RNG element now is does it take you 15 rolls to max it out or 18 rolls or 21 rolls? I think that that random variation is enough and sufficient to provide some sort of, I don't want to say unpredictability, but random chance element, gamish mechanic, whatever you want to call it, and that's fine. The point is now if you have the resources and put the time and effort into it, you will get up to the same level as everybody else, and I think it does basically plateau out the playing field, especially when you start talking about things like PvP. The other thing that is very interesting is now that we get all these different options for experimental effects that cost a finite amount of resources instead of, again, having to be lucky and hitting the roulette wheel or slot machine, whatever you want to call it, in order to get special effects, and you just now purchase that going forward. I'm liking all of these systems. More and more items do have engineering options on them. In all, this is a much better engineering system than what we had previously, and I think that this is one of the better elements of this patch. Unfortunately, that is where the positive aspects for this patch end. The new crime and punishment system, I was wanting to give it kind of the benefit of the doubt, waiting to see how it played out in the actual game world beyond just the beta testing servers, and it's very clear that this new system is even more convoluted, complex, and horrendously bad UI into figuring it out. Nowhere in the game is one of my friends that I was playing it with pointed out, does it tell you about these changes? If you weren't paying attention to Reddit or the forums, you wouldn't know how this new system works. It's not like they pop it up in the first time you load into the game after the patch and say, hey, here's the changes. Now, I know it is in the launcher, but if you launch like through Steam, and especially Steam VR, you may never even see it on the launcher patch. 
or the, the patcher or launcher. So it's one of those things that I understand where they're coming from, especially with that significant of a change to how it plays out. The other bad thing about it is I don't think that it really does anything to deter the motor hobos out there and instead just makes it more inconvenient, complex, and annoying for those who aren't engaging in open play or mainly are PVEers. You can say what you want about that. If it's not, if it's basically putting an undue burden on probably what are the vast majority of the player base still playing the game and doesn't really solve ultimately the murder hobo problem, then I think this new system is primarily a failure. Now, there's a few things that they could do that could help out, such as making notoriety in the UI panels a little bit more prominent so you know what your notoriety level is, and more importantly, how much longer you have for it to tick down. Now, they did fix it to where if you sit in a station, your notoriety does not decrease, but then all you have to do is go out into normal space and just hit your engines, boost out a couple of times, and keep going, and then go change a diaper, burp a baby, uh, take a nap, whatever you have to do, and then come back a couple of hours later, and your notoriety is gone. You can go to an interstellar faction, clear whatever it is that was on you, and go about your business. I don't mind elements of bounties being tied to ships rather than commanders in certain aspects. And there's some other elements there that I'm kind of like, eh, it's, it's okay, it works. But still, I think it's overly complex and fundamentally still does not solve the problems that many people were having. Then you have the infamous broken slot machine where missions were paying out more than they should, so they took them out and then reintroduced them added a bunch of new features that weren't tested in the beta with the Guardian equipment that was had the ability to be engineered but wasn't supposed to be engineered and all of this other stuff that just at this point is more of the same coming out of their development cycles to be expected at this point and it's kind of a shame. Every time they do this, every time there's problems because essentially it goes untested and then put right into production and this is the result. And I think that this goes back to a just general problem the game has always had, that their payout schemes was off by a factor of 5 to 15. That there should be some end-game missions and things like that that pay out 30, 50, 100 million credits on a routine basis. So that if you spend the time and effort to get a Cutter, a Corvette, an Anaconda, uh, or I guess in this day and age a Type 10 Defender, that you'll be able to use those ships in order to amass the substantial sums of credits in game in order to equip and outfit them. I mean, when armor for a cutter, for instance, the, the top tier armor costs like 400 million credits, if it's going to take somebody 200 hours to grind for it, that's a serious barrier kind of to entry. And how many people who take a look at that and say, well, it's taken me 150, 200 hours to get to this point, and now it's going to take me another 200 hours just to max the ship out. No thanks, I'm ready to go on and move on to another game. Now the argument against this is, well then it would be too easy. Well, there's been so many broken mechanics and exploitable mechanics in the game for so long now, I don't think it matters. Quint, Robigo, Sothosios... I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, some community goals that paid out 10 times what they probably should have. Hey, at this point, that ship has sailed. Make credits a lot easier, and who cares if it takes somebody 60 hours or 100 hours or 150 hours? Yeah, I know some people will be like, well, it took me 400 hours. Well, so what? At this point, I think that ship has sailed, especially given that the impact it has on the background simulation and the economics of the game and the fact that those are all pretty static and not really able to be played or manipulated to any, I would say, extreme degree or really any beyond just a, a minor kind of blip in the radar. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if a commander has a million credits or a hundred billion credits. The fact they have a hundred billion credits really doesn't affect me playing the game and my game maybe other than the exception of if you're an open and PVPing and somebody that has 100 billion credits can, can afford more rebuys than you can. But credits, just generally speaking, have not been that difficult to earn in the game. I would like to see them kind of kick it up a notch to where, hey, if somebody gets everything that they want out of 200 hours worth of game time in the game, 
maybe after maybe they do get bored and go on to another game but hey when more content and stuff like that is released i think that they'd be more willing to come back to the game at a later point if the reward structures were tiered in such a way that especially at the late in game stages it was more meaningful impactful and less grind and more reward and I think it would also encourage people to spend less time, quote, grinding and more time, oh, hey, I got the credits. Now I want to go out and explore. Now I want to go to find these old colonies or these generation ships or these mega ships and try different things. Oh, hey, losing a 40 million credit rebuy in a cutter for because I went pirating against a mega ship and the ATR people came in and blew me away. Make that less impactful to where, oh, well, now if I just do a couple of missions for an hour or two, I can you know basically recover that loss as opposed to well crap now it's going to take me 10 hours of bounty hunting in order to do that I, I think that those reward mechanics and balances there at that stage would be a whole lot better finally there's wing missions which is just too little too late really if these were the wing missions that had been introduced three years ago when wings was added to the game it would have been acceptable back then even two and a half years ago but they are at this point two and a half years, too late, and it is too little. Friends and I did some wing missions the first two or three days after the patch was released, and hey, it was kind of fun, but then it got to be, well, this is just the same mission over and over again when it came to killing pirate lords and stuff like that. Yes, it's more difficult than by yourself, but most of us have top-rated cutters in the game. It was no difficulty whatsoever for us to go in and solo those type missions by ourselves. And the trading missions at this point were so past cargo hauling in the game as any interest to do that didn't really matter at that either. Nor was there really any incentive to go hunting Thargoids or participate in any of the community goals. And it just seemed like, once again, fell back into the trap of, well, let's just go bounty hunting, let's just kind of do the same things over and over again. And I think a lot of that is the fact that there is a lack of mission types. There's lack of mission variety. There's a lack of branching story arcs and possibilities. When it's basically you're hunting the same Anaconda, FDL, and a couple of three, four smaller ships that might be a little bit more randomized. You know, it's the same shit, different day type thing. And I really hope that they spend some time and effort with these, quote, smaller content updates creating more of these missions for wings to go on. Still, we don't have planetary missions such as Kill the Goliath that can be shared with wings. And there are still many of those type of missions that are part of the mission system and mission board that I think would add a little bit more variety then, there. And then again, if we can increase the payouts for some of this as well as the difficulty levels and some of that thing, maybe we could see you know, more players engaging in it. I, I don't know. How much have you been using any of the wing missions except for maybe to do a little bit more haulage and get better rewards out of it? Let me know in the comment section down below. Ultimately though, Elite Dangerous still has the same fundamental problem. Back when the Space Sim Kickstarter thing started in 2012 with Star Citizen and Elite Dangerous, I was kind of excited because I was a huge fan of the Space Sim genre in the 90s, in particular the X-Wing series, Wing Commander Privateer and was looking for that experience brought basically up to date with modern graphic standards and the ability to do multiplayer aspects that really haven't seen since the days of X-Wing Alliance and Free Space 2. And in that respect, Elite Dangerous has delivered kind of what I've been wanting for 20 years in Wing Commander Privateer, the MMO. However, where it falls short is in the interactions with the galaxy, the fact that to build a new station you have to do a community goal, and that is all basically curated by a, a game, a dungeon master, for lack of a better term, in the form of FDev staff, not to take away from what they do do. But the fact that the background sim can't automatically take into account what commanders are doing although now we do kind of have a heat map to show what commanders are doing versus the background sim in the galaxy map, which is a nice addition to the game. But still, our ability to affect that background sim is still so very limited. And again, go back to the 1.1 trailers over four years ago now, I guess, or three years ago, in uh, spring of 2015, 
of showing stations being constructed over the course of days, weeks, and months. Interestingly enough, with the having to repair stations after Thargoid uh, attacks being introduced late last year, early this year, whenever that was, it's a shame that we can't use those type of mechanics to then basically facilitate building out space stations deeper into space. And, hey, due to players' activities in the system, it will cause, you know, after so many weeks or so many days of activity or certain threshold level of activity, a mining colony to show up. Or, you know, an extraction economy with an outpost or a planetary base if there's a landable system or a landable moon in that system. And then by interacting with that over time, it grows, becomes larger, and players could see the results of their activities in the game more directly. And again, it doesn't have to be direct, oh, you plant the colony, build it up, which that might be a cool feature to be introduced at a later time as well, but through your interactions with a background sim to provide meaning. That's just not there, and I just don't believe at this point probably ever will be. And this lack of a social, political, economic side of the gameplay is entirely lacking. And some of my friends and I, who utterly and thoroughly enjoy the, you know, airplanes in space, dogfighting elements that Elite Dangerous does bring to the game, and many of the aspects of the game find that this one core component is what is lacking for us to keeping us relatively engaged, really probably beyond this year, and I'll put my kind of self included in that I'll still be playing Elite Dangerous I'll probably be playing a lot less of it over the course of this year partially because little baby girl takes up a whole huge swath of time and the other part of it is I'm kind of to that point in Elite well what else is there to do and whenever friends do come back and play for a while it is falling back into the same traps of doing the same things we were essentially doing three or four years ago and that's fine for a time but without that kind of social, economic, competitive arena to play in as as part of the sandbox, I I don't really see what's there to keep me going in Elite Dangerous beyond this. Beyond, beyond. Uh, It could be the introduction of fleet carriers later on in this year and a little bit more actual organized guild mechanics. But again, if the if those elements can't interact with the background sim in some sort of meaningful, productive way, it's going to be another one of these tacked-on wasted features. And I have to say, I'm looking at Dual Universe right now. Uh, I've not backed it in any meaningful way until it gets to a more or less open beta stage where most of the elements are working and has proved to be working. I'm probably going to stay away from it. I've been burned enough with early access titles, as it were. But it is a title that I am looking very closely at as being what I was hoping initially to get out of Star Citizen. But I don't think that Star Citizen is going to be able to achieve those goals, uh, especially on the networking side of things. But that's an entirely different discussion. But it looks like the Dual Universe game, although it won't be necessarily flying in cockpits, will offer the ability to do the base building, clan, guild, engagement in socio-economic, political battles that I find completely and utterly lacking from Elite. And I was hoping, even if it wasn't direct competition between Guild A, Guild B, and say an Evesque environment, I was still hoping that there would be a way that, even if we didn't want to be competitive, let's just say me, five, six, seven, eight, ten of my friends decide, hey, There's this star system that we found that has some good mining and stuff in it. We'd like to try to build up this particular star system and maybe the region surrounding it. And maybe get a player group faction that's an NPC faction planted there to call our own and and see the results of that being grown into a colony and then a bigger spaceport, multiple spaceports, then an outpost to a full-fledged station. And whether or not it's a high-tech or mining station could be dependent on what materials do we deliver to that station. Did a couple of series of videos on this uh, a year, year and a half, two years ago now, about those type of aspects of integration and interaction with the background sim that Elite is just still at this point missing. And I see no real discussion about improving that. So, 
that's kind of where I am with Elite at the moment. I will still be keeping an eye on it. Again, I probably will not be playing uh, extensively in Elite for the foreseeable future. I will be turning my attention more to Flight Sims to finish off a add-on that I've been working on over the course of the past year in my spare time, and basically going to full-time on it over the next couple of months to try to get it ready and on the market before Father's Day. So, yeah, I'm going to be focusing more on that. Uh, a couple of my friend, other friends have kind of come back to the flight sim world and want to get more involved in DCS again. I've got to do some things with probably not going through Steam VR to get all of that set up, so I will probably be recording some of those sessions and putting up there uh, whenever we do get together on the weekends and can fly a couple of missions. Uh, looking forward to a few other things in the flight sim world this year. Uh, the Rotate MD-11 could be out this year or later on. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. The DCS F-18 is another one that I'm looking forward to. Um, but yeah, that that's probably most of my time for the remainder of this year. Barring Frontier just comes out of nowhere and in one of these updates and maybe the, the update later on this year just completely knocks it out of the park and adds in those elements that myself and many other people have felt has been missing for so long from the game. But I relatively doubt it at this point. Well, thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, click the little notification bell icon, and, uh, well, I'll see you next time.